Let's start with perhaps the most anticipated feature in the history of C++ modules. For over 30 years, C++ has relied on the include directive. And let's be honest, include can be kind of dumb. It is pretty much a copy-paste command. If you include a header in 50 different source files, the compiler has to parse that same text 50 times. It's slow and it leaks macros everywhere. Modules change the game by allowing us to share declarations and definitions across translation units, without the constant copy pasta of headers. The compiler parses a module once, creates a binary interface, and that's it. Let's look at the syntax. Here is a simple math library. Notice the syntax. We start with export module mathlib. This tells the compiler that this is a module unit. Any function I want to be visible to the outside world, I tag with export. But look at secret helper. I didn't export it. In the old header file days, I'd have to hide this in a namespace or a CPP file to prevent people from using it. But here it is invisible by default. It simply doesn't exist to the importer. In our main file, we don't include the import. This import mathlib is pretty neat. It imports the meaning of the code, not the text. This also means macro definitions inside mathlib do not leak into main. I can see three advantages to using this. First of all, it makes for cleaner code. No more macro collisions or one definition rule violations. The second point is encapsulation. It gives you explicit control over your public API. And the third advantage is greatly improved compile speed for massive projects. Because the module interface is only parsed once. Now, a quick warning. Build system support and tooling are still maturing for modules, but the feature itself is stable and ready for you to experiment with. Next up, concepts. If you write generic code using templates, you know the pain that comes when someone misuses them. Let's say you write a function that expects a number, then someone passes a std string. What happens is the compiler vomits a horrifying wall of text talking just about everything. Before C++ 20, if we wanted to restrict the template parameter t to only be an integer type, we had to rely on complex techniques like sfine and enable if. It was hard to read and more frustrating to debug. C++ 20 fixes this by allowing us to explicitly state the requirements for a template parameter. These requirements are called concepts. Let's rewrite that function using the explicit requires clause. We simply added the requires std integral part. This is called a predicate, a compile time boolean check. Crucially, if we try to pass a float or a string to this function now, the compiler doesn't give us a cryptic output. It gives us a clean, readable error saying, Constraints are not satisfied. This makes using templates a tad easier. The syntax gets even cleaner thanks to abbreviated function templates. We can actually use concepts directly in the function arguments like this. One may call this beautiful. This solution spares our eyes from the capital T's. It looks like a normal function, but auto tells us that it's a template. And std integral tells the compiler the enforced constraint, which is std integral in this case. The standard library provides dozens of predefined concepts in the concepts header, like std copyable, std derived from, or std invocable. But the real power comes from defining your own custom concepts fitting them to your own wants and needs. For example, let's define a concept that ensures an object has a valid ID method. We define has ID using the requires keyword. We check if calling the ID method on T is valid and if the return type converts to an integer. Now, if we would pass an object without a valid ID method, the code would fail to compile, and the error will point directly to the unmet has ID concept. Concepts can enforce requirements, making generic code safer and generally speaking, more readable. Now that we've covered C++20's modules and concepts, let's move on to the third major feature, ranges. This is the feature that modernizes how we actually work with data and algorithms in the standard library. For decades, the standard template library has been powerful but verbose. If you wanted to filter a vector, 
and then transform the results, you had to write sometimes brain numbing nested function calls, or manage temporary containers, or deal with begin and end iterator pairs everywhere. It was efficient, but it was ugly to read and difficult to write. C20 ranges changes this by introducing two key concepts ranges and views. A range is simply anything you can iterate over, so you no longer need to pass the begin and the end iterator pairs to sort a list. You just pass the vector itself. But what may be even more influential is views. A view is a lightweight wrapper that doesn't own the data. It simply looks at the data. And because they are lightweight, they are composed lazily. Let's look at a classic data processing pipeline. Suppose we have a list of numbers. We want to filter out the odd numbers, square the remaining even numbers, and then reverse the final list. In C20, we use the pipe syntax, similar to the command line. Look at how readable that is. We take numbers, pipe it into a filter, pipe that into a transform, and pipe that into a reverse. This reads exactly like the problem statement. Filter, then square, then reverse. But here is the kicker. This uses lazy evaluation. When we define results, nothing actually happens yet. No memory is allocated for a new vector. The calculation is only performed continuously as we iterate through the loop at the bottom. This is highly efficient because it combines all those operations into a single loop. We only have to walk through the list once rather than looping three separate times. Because you treat the container as one whole unit, you don't have to manually manage begin and end iterators. This effectively kills off those annoying off by one errors where you accidentally point to the wrong memory. You can mix and match these commands easily. You can take the first few elements or drop the last ones without any performance penalty. That's because no data is actually being moved around. It's a massive improvement over the old verbal syntax. While the major features are important, C20 also includes many quality of life updates. Smaller improvements that make your daily coding a bit smoother. Let's go through a quick list of the ones you will find most useful. First up is Stud Format. For a long time we had to choose. Do we use printf, which is concise but dangerous, or IO streams, which are safe but incredibly messy to read. Stud format finally gives us the best of both worlds. It combines type safety with a clean, stylish syntax using curly braces. It is faster than IOS streams, type safe and much easier to read. You can even put formatting rules right inside the curly braces. Things like rounding numbers or aligning text happen right there. So you don't need those messy old comments anymore, like the dreaded stud set precision. Next up is the spaceship operator, named because its symbol looks like a UFO. Before C20, if you wanted to compare two objects, you had to manually write six separate functions. One for less than, one for equals, one for greater than, and so on. It was a massive amount of repetitive code for something so simple. Now you write a single line using the spaceship operator and set it to default. This tells the compiler to look at your class members from top to bottom and generate all six comparison checks for you. While you can write custom logic if you really need to, this default behavior works for almost every standard class. Third, we have designated initializers. This makes initializing simple objects much more readable. In the past, initializing a struct meant passing a list of mystery numbers and values. You had to memorize what each position meant. Now you can tag each value with its name. This makes the code instantly readable. You know exactly what a number may represent. But there is a catch you need to know about. C++ is strict about order. You must list these tags in the same order they appear in the struct. Here you can't put verbos before timeout. The benefit here is clarity, not shuffling the order of variables. Finally, we have the range-based for loop with initialization. In older C++, if you try to iterate over a temporary result, like the output of a function, it sometimes got destroyed before the loop even finished. This behavior led to crashes. The new syntax lets you create that variable right inside the loop statement. 
guaranteeing it stays alive until the loop is done. It prevents the dreaded dangling reference bugs where a temporary is destroyed before you finish iterating over it. It's a small syntax change that can come in handy. Finally, we arrive at the last member of the big four features of C++20, coroutines. This is arguably the most complex addition to C++20 but it unlocks a whole new way of writing code. To understand why this is really useful, we have to look at how functions usually work. When you call a function, it pushes a frame onto the stack. It runs until it finishes and then it destroys that frame and returns. It is all or nothing. You cannot stop a function in the middle and come back to it later without losing its state. A core routine is different because it works like a save point in a video game. Normal functions have to run from start to finish in one go. A core routine can hit pause, save all local variables and progress to memory, and let you resume the game later exactly where you left off. But why does this matter? There are two reasons. First, generators. Instead of creating a giant vector of a million numbers and filling up your RAM, a generator calculates just one number. It hands you the number and waits. It's data on demand. Second, async I.O. Usually, waiting for a network download freezes your application or forces you to write messy callback code. Coroutines let you write code that looks like a simple step-by-step -step list. But behind the scenes, it handles all the waiting without freezing your app. However, there is a catch. C++20 provides the language features. The keywords like co-await, yield and return, but it does not provide the library types like task or generator out of the box. We have to build them or use a library. Let's see a coroutine in action. We are going to look at a generator. Imagine a function that generates an infinite sequence of integers. In standard C++, you'd need a class with state variables to track where you are. With coroutines, you just write a loop. A quick heads up. We are using a custom generator class here as the standard one officially arrived in C++23, but the mechanics are identical. Here is the magic keyword, co yield. When the code hits this line, it doesn't return. It just suspends. It takes a snapshot of the current state, variables and line number, saves it to the heap, and hands control back to whoever called it. When we call counter function with 10, the function does not start running. Instead, it returns a generator object that is effectively paused at the very beginning. Think of numbers like a media player. Inside the loop, we call resume, that's the play button. The function wakes up, runs until it hits yield, hands us a value, and then automatically hits pause. It stays frozen in that state, remembering exactly where it is until we hit play again in the next loop iteration. We are in total control of the speed. This is called lazy evaluation. It allows you to process massive files or infinite streams of data without blowing up your RAM. But there is another keyword. Co-await. While co-yield pauses to give you a value, co-await pauses to wait for an operation to finish. Think of a network call. Instead of blocking your entire program while waiting for a server to reply, co-await pauses just that one function. Your UI stays responsive and once the data arrives, the function picks up exactly where it left off. No callbacks are required. Just remember, C++20 only gives you the keywords. For broader usage, you have two choices. Write a lot of difficult boilerplate code to define how the coroutine behaves. Or simply download a library like CPP Coro that does the hard work for you. Now that we have covered the complex logic of coroutines, let's shift gears to safety and performance. The most impactful tool in this category is Studspan. This replaces the classic C-style pattern of passing a pointer and a length. Now, obviously you can still do that, or you can pass a reference to specific containers, but Studspan gives you a standard vocabulary for a sequence of data. It's lightweight, literally just a pointer and a size, but it carries that size information with it automatically. It means you can write one function that accepts a std vector, a std array, or a row c array without any extra boilerplate. Then we have constival. 
This solves a specific problem with constxpr. Sometimes you write a constxpr function expecting it to run at compile time, but you accidentally pass it a runtime value and it silently runs at runtime instead, resulting in slowing down your app. Constival prevents that accident. It forces the evaluation to happen immediately, hence the name immediate function. It's perfect for things like parsing static strings or validating configuration constants. If the input isn't known at compile time, the build simply fails. Finally, for concurrency, we have std jfred. It's essentially a std thread that cleans up after itself. With the old std thread, if you forgot to join before the destructor ran, the runtime would call std terminate and kill the program. When std jfred goes out of scope, it automatically requests stop and joins. It also standardizes thread cancellation. Instead of using a custom boolean flag to tell a thread to exist, jfred provides a built-in stop token. It's cooperative, meaning your thread has to check it. But it finally gives us a standard way for stopping tasks. To wrap things up, I want to highlight a few smaller library additions that clean up the code we write every day. First, the new bit header standardizes bit manipulation. If you've ever had to use generic compiler intrinsics just to count bits or check NDNS, you can now replace those with portable standard functions like std pop count. For math heavy code, the numbers header saves you from defining your own constants. Provides values like std numbers by, which are templated, meaning they automatically adjust to the correct precision whether you use float, double or long double. On the convenience side, std map and set finally received a contains method. It's a minor change, but simply writing map that contains key is significantly more readable than the old idiom of checking if find returns the end iterator. And finally, std source location modernizes logging. For example, it allows you to capture the file name and line number of a call site as a default function argument. C++ 20 is a massive update. We've covered the heavy hitters like modules and coroutines, along with everyday tools like std format. It doesn't magically fix every legacy code base, but it definitely gives us the tools to write clearer, safer code moving forward. If you got value out of this deep dive, do me a favor and check out the rest of the channel. We are building a library of modern C++ content and your support really helps. I've linked the video on the end screen that I think you'll find useful. Click that if you want to keep going. Thanks for watching.